I am the um, founding president of the Solar Alliance uh, in my country, which is roughly three years old. So it's a very young industry association. That is my night job. My day job is that <laughs> I'm a solar uh, developer, um, Solaris uh, Partners, and um, we develop solar projects for utility scale, off-grid, and rooftops. So, um, my colleague. Mr. Fahad Tawhi. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Vahid Fatuhi. Um, I also have two jobs. I, on, during the daytime, I work for an American EPC contractor with interests in the Middle East. And I also, I'm also the founder and the president of the Emirates Solar Industry Association, which is the largest trade association for solar in the Middle East and North Africa. And our role is to bring the private sector and policymakers together towards building uh, and expanding the, the solar industry in the Middle East. Yes. Okay, my name is Tetsuro Nagata, and I have two titles. And one is uh, I have been a president of U.S. Energy Holdings. It's uh, uh, deploying a business not only a wind power but uh, starting uh, this uh, starting a wind power business. And the uh, country is covers uh, not only Japan and Korea and Asian countries but Australia. And uh, starting from the United States, California, and uh, going to the UK, Italy, Spain, Norway. So it's a uh, well balanced. We are uh, appreciated by the uh, financial analysts because. Uh, Wind energy is uh, very volatile and uh, very uh, fluctuating. So we have, we are told that uh, we have a good portfolio. It's a very wind is a very random phenomenon. And also the dear title I have uh, working as the president of uh, Japan Wind Power Association. So in these few years we have fought it with uh, not only the, with the Japanese government but. Uh, also for the uh, anti, not nuclear, anti renewable energy, who is pressing, uh, proceed to nuclear power. So they, they have some uh, wind power or solar power. Uh, renewable energy passion, it's uh, st not stable and very expensive. But we are fight, fighting and uh, Finally, the last year we achieved a new feed-in tariff system, so it's a very uh, we have a good future now. Thank you. If I could leave the microphone with you and mm. uh, and ask uh, um, if you could explain what the Fukushima effect has been mm. in Japan. <coughs> uh, after Fukushima accident, there uh, of course there no more Fukushima. Uh, their uh, majority, not I said not majority, that just the half of the Japanese is opposing to stop the nuclear power. But instead, what, instead, but the other side, uh, almost a half, is uh, we wouldn't like to uh, endure the very uh, inconvenient society without nuclear power. We have to import the oil and fossil fuels instead of nuclear power, so the tariff of UTT is going up. So we can enjoy that. And there are a lot of blackout after Fukushima because uh, uh, just two units out of 50 nuclear power is stopped. It's under inspection by the Japanese government, by civil inspection. And after that they can restart, but uh, we are talking about the restart of the nuclear power. So uh, I, I should say, if you answer your question, there are uh, half and half. So the Japanese attitude is uh, even after Fukushima, they are uh, <coughs> supporting nuclear power, and um, the other half is supporting, uh, opposing to nuclear power, and uh, it's uh, uh, renewable power is. Uh, referred to both sides and the uh, anti-nuclear power is uh, maybe overestimate the law of renewable energy 
and the people who are supporting the nuclear power is a very passion. Minyamo power is not reliable. So it's a very uh, great dispute, political dispute, I think. So given that uh, Japan has the nuclear power, mm -hmm. uh, it is likely to continue with that into the uh, foreseeable future. Uh, yes, and the current government, uh, so the, uh, last year there was a general election and the old government changed. The old government would like to stop the almost a nuclear power, but uh, that party defeated and the LDP changed to the new, new government and uh, officially they would like to uh, restart over the new, uh, nuclear power. So they would like to some portion of the Japanese energy, uh, maybe 15 to 20 percent, maybe should be sub supplied by nuclear energy still in the future. So it's also the, there's another election this summer, so it's all, also a great dispute for that election. Okay. So, so in practice, it seems that perhaps one of the biggest political impacts mm -hmm. of uh, the event was thousands of miles away in Germany. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, it's very similar to that. But I could ask the uh, other, actually, let's, let's pass the microphone to, to Mrs. Kaplan, because you were very good with the technology last time. <laughs> you found the on-off switch very quickly. Um, and ask, you know, uh, do, do you, have you seen any effect uh, in your own country from the, uh, the Fukushima incident in terms of political will for uh, renewables? Well, um, we, didn't, we don't have any nuclear in the Philippines, but the nuclear energy is, very, is a very emotional issue. Um, in, uh, sometime in the uh, late 80s, uh, we had to mothball a, uh, uh, a newly built um, nuclear plant facility when renewable was not yet fashionable. So uh, that um, negative reaction to a uh, nuclear facility in the Philippines uh, has uh, pretty much affected uh, the decision-making process of our politicians. So um, it is something that is considered by our policymaker as a solution moving forward. It continues to be an emotional issue, especially now when our president is the son of the former president who uh, mothballed the nuclear power facility. So I don't know how to respond to that, but basically um, it's an emotional issue. And uh, it's, it doesn't have any relationship, at least in the present debate, on the renewable energy um, policies in the Philippines. Okay, thank you. Mr. Fatuhi, um, is there any uh, effect here in the Arabian Peninsula? I imagine not, but uh, perhaps there is. The, the effect in, in the Middle East has been limited. Countries that already were reluctant to go into renewables or nuclear use this as validation not to go. But in some cases, the economic drivers are so strong that they just see the Fukushima incident as how important it is to put in place strong safety measures. More, it's also important to indicate that unlike the Philippines and Japan, the, uh, the chances of catastrophic environmental events leading up to a disaster like Fukushima are extremely slim. The, 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 you know, the, the topographical uh, uh, layout of the Gulf is relatively stable and there's not been any um, major earthquakes in the last 50, 80 years. So they have that, uh, they have that assurance. And as I mentioned earlier, because the growth rate is so significant and because they're burning so much of the oil already, they see nuclear as a, as a necessity. And we have seen the UAE uh, already signed contracts with Korean entities to build and they've already started laying the foundation for what will be a 2.4 gigawatt nuclear complex um, near the Rubel Khali, 
region, which is the bordering area between Abu Dhabi and Saudi Arabia. And we've also seen uh, Saudi Arabia and Jordan look very seriously into nuclear. Okay, thank you. And if we move it away from the, the politics then and talk about um, uh, issues on, on the commercial aspects of uh, encouraging the integration of uh, renewables in, and feed-in tariffs, uh, what, what's the situation in the, uh, in the Emirates on uh, those kind of commercial encouragements? The Emirates, are, as in the Middle East, uh, the nuance has been that they are blessed with huge reserves of oil and gas. And uh, the political structure has been monarchical. And so the people have expected the regimes to give them quasi-free electricity and water uh, in exchange for uh, support of their monarchies. And this, uh, this relationship has been in place for the last 50 years and the people of the Middle East have become used to very cheap fuel. And for example, if you're a national in Abu Dhabi or Saudi Arabia, you get your electricity for practically free. I think it's cost you know, two to three cents per kilowatt hour, which is you know, up to one, you know, one tenth of what you would pay in Europe. And this has led to a, a surge in consumption and inefficiencies. Uh, the reason why solar hasn't picked up is because the cost of solar is, you know, let's say, let's assume 10 percent, 10 cents a kilowatt hour. That's three times the price, and so the government would need to pay a hefty subsidy to offset the cost of solar versus conventional power. But two things have happened. First, the cost of generating conventional power has risen bec uh, because some of these countries have had to import fuel like diesel. Many people don't know it, but Saudi Arabia now imports up to a million tons of diesel every month from around the world, primarily from Europe, paying $120 a barrel. So the cost of generating conventional electricity has gone up, and the cost of solar has gone down. And, and so now the Middle East are revisiting the equation and saying, okay, maybe solar is not so expensive. And in fact, in some countries, such as uh, Morocco and Jordan and even in Dubai, solar has now reached grid parity. So it's a very exciting time and it's, this is why we're now seeing a surge in demand and interest in solar power. You must feel pretty happy about that. <laughs> well, you see, to give you some background, before I joined solar I was in oil and gas and I was with an organization that did a lot of trading, buying and selling oil and gas. And Earlier on, we were, just, we were just exporting a lot of these fuels out of the Middle East. But through time, I saw that I was importing more and more fuel oil and diesel into the Middle East at a very expensive prices, and it just dawned on me that this makes no sense. You know, th this is costing a lot of money, and meanwhile, they have this abundance of solar. And it, it, it became clear to me that solar was going to be a huge growth industry. And it, while it's moving slowly, it's clear that every year, it, the market is almost going to double in size. Hmm. Now, perhaps I can ask Mrs. Uh, Kaplan. The, um, you, you were telling me earlier that uh, there's been a great success at the uh, at the small scale installation end in solar in the in the Philippines. Um, what what is the situation for encouraging um, uh, larger scale? Well, um, just as a background, the early experience of the Philippines in solar energy is in the off grid sector. This is uh, part and parcel of the solution that was provided by government in its rural electrification program because we are 7,100 islands. So there are very remote locations that are not connected to the main grid. Neither are they connected to the island grids. So these uh, small islands with um, uh, five, uh, six villages in one location um, are totally dependent on kerosene. And therefore, those have been the focus of rural electrification. And the solution that was provided by mostly donor agencies and government would be solar home systems of small types, 20 watt peak, 40 watt peak, 60 watt peak. So this was where solar started, the solar experiment started in the Philippines. So there is a very positive feedback from that experience. And in fact, 
uh, as we moved to the old grid, a lot of people would ask, oh, do you, do you have batteries? I mean, when already we're talking about utility scale. So um, uh, the, um, according to the Department of Energy, the total on-grid, uh, off-grid rather, installation would reach by as much as three megawatt. If you put everything together, okay, if you consolidate everything, that would be just about the installed capacity for off-grid. Um, now for the on-grid sector, the success of the rooftop is, uh, is something that is worth looking at because in a period of less than two years from a very small watt size installation on rooftop, we now have about 1.2 megawatt. Half of that is from the Asian Development Bank, which is a 570 kilowatt, which demonstrated to the energy sector what solar uh, could do you know, in providing solutions to rising electricity prices in the Philippines. So the forecast for next year will, in for the rooftop sector on use, not dependent on the feed-in tariff, would reach to as much as about five megawatt, mm -hmm. uh, at least uh, in uh, 20, uh, uh, 2014, January of 2014. And the driving force for that is not the feed-in tariff, but really the rising electricity prices at the retail level, which is about 26 cents. Mm -hmm. So in the uh, large-scale utility, um, uh, there's not much success there, and compared to Thailand, uh, Thailand is in a better shape because their installation target <coughs> is rather in the vicinity of already about 600, 500 megawatt. Um, and while in the Philippines, we still have the one megawatt experimental <coughs> utility scale solar in Mindanao, in the in south of the Philippines. But because of the energy def deficit in the southern parts of the Philippines, one would expect that in the next year or so, you will find electric, electric cooperatives, which is equivalent to our to, to distribution utility companies, would be probably signing bilateral contracts just to experiment on solar and see how they work. So the projection, the fairness forecast there is that the installation for utility scale under the non-feeding tariff would be also substantial. So there is a market in the Philippines. Um, we are more market determined and uh, not really a feed-in tariff uh, driven because of the overarching policy reform that the Philippines is uh, currently under through its Power Reform Act. Right. So it's really more market driven, yeah. pretty much like the United States. I would say. I think we could contrast that with the, with the, uh, the Japanese experience where the, the headline number for the feed-in tariff is quite exciting mm -hmm. in itself. Yes. I said, uh, as I said before, that the feed-in tariff, the new feed-in tariff system started for last year. And the level of the tariff is uh, uh, 40 yen. It's just more than 40 US cents for the PV. And 20 yen is more than 24 cents, US cents, for wind power. And uh, there are two, two points for that. And, uh, why it's so expensive for the, not only the PV but the wind power. But talking about in terms of wind power, uh, we have a, a, one is that the Japanese wind, wind farms is very uh, small scale. Almost the majority is less than five wind turbines, so we can't, we couldn't enjoy the economies of scale. And the, one, the second reason maybe the yen was had to be very appreciated, so it seems to be very expensive, but now it's adjusted gradually. And the third, third reason is that the, we have a very strict uh, natural conditions. For example, uh, typhoon, earthquake, lightning, or something like that, tsunami, or something like that. So, uh, the Japanese government requires a very strict regulation standard compared to the world standard. So, it leads to the high cost of uh, wind power. And uh, so, it, 
put the evidence of that high cost that of all, for example, about 50% of the total construction cost is uh, uh, no, two, uh, yes, half of the total construction we will need power is uh, just wage turbines. It's the portion is very low. In the world standard, maybe two thirds of the total construction is uh, uh, wind turbines. That it means that EPC cost is very expensive in Japan. It needs a lot of steel work and it's very mountainous. So, so it get uh, very the wind turbines very costly. And the second point, why the PP is so expensive compared to wind power? It may be the uh, maybe the uh, PV side is very uh, technical to polit politicians that uh, you, if you promote the PV industry, PV power in Japan, if you so it lead to the benefit of the, the Japanese PV manufacturing. Like Mitsubishi, a lot of manufacturers. But for the, in terms of wind power, they are not of such a like only Mitsubishi or Hitachi, uh, GSW, just three manufacturers. So if you uh, promote the wind power, it, uh, almost the whole benefit is going out of Japan, Japan and going to the foreign manufacturers like the Vestas, Siemens, G or something like that. So it's not true, but uh, very technical, uh, poli political campaign from the uh, PV side. So maybe it, it's one of the reasons for the it's a very favorable time for PV is a disaster. But uh, in the second year, it's cut uh, just it's just 10 percent, so it decreased from 40 yen to 36 yen, but it's still expensive. Okay. Thank you. Thank yes. you. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left, so I'd like to open up for questions from the floor. Is there anybody who has a question for our panelists? Just curious, as you get more of these renewables, and as you say, it's, it's building up quite quickly, so at times the majority of electricity in many countries will be from renewables. Uh, just interested in your view, what's the impact on the remaining fossil fuel stations? In the past, fossil fuel stations have got bigger, larger, focusing on the efficiencies. Presumably, as you get more renewables, flexibility must be the name of the game, in which case would you see the fossil fuel power station, the gas turbines that are, will still be needed? Will they have to downsize? Will they have to get smaller and more distributed? What will be the sort of impact uh, as the renewables grow? Maybe I can ask Mr. Fatuhi to ask them, answer that first because uh, you have uh, some insight from the way this interacts with your diesel and oil imports. The good news is that there is enough demand for everything, whether it's oil powered or hydro or wind or solar. The, the issue is a lack of infrastructure and a lack of capacity. And across the Middle East, you're seeing the growth of demand outpace the growth of production. And so new infrastructure is being built to accommodate the rise in demand as opposed to offsetting existing demand. And so we're not worried that these plants will continue, but when they need to be replaced, uh, for a diesel plant, for example, rather than building another diesel generator, what you could do is build uh, you know, a PV plant. And that way, you at least can continue to meet your baseload demand with diesel. But when the demand rises in midday, that spike in demand can be offset using solar power. And so we see enough room for both uh, conventional power plants and renewable energy power plants. Mrs. Kaplan, do you have any, any comment on that? Um, 
I think the prediction uh, in terms of economic growth in this part of the world is very optimistic. So in the Philippines alone, the World Bank has said that we will probably grow uh, from 6.5 to 7 percent. That is a very encouraging sign, which means that moving forward, there has to be uh, a generation mix that would allow energy capacity to expand um, at the time that they are needed and basically the capacity that will provide the base load and the peak load. So my take on this is that one, there should be a healthy mix of the different, of the different sources of energy. Certainly as we move solar into uh, areas where um, we need the substantial base load, you know, diesel is going to be a part of it. It's only a question of what should be dispatched first, given the economics of those two sources of power. In the same way in the on-grid sector, uh, with the rising uh, cost of, uh, of, um, of uh, coal and also of uh, some gas, uh, there are other renewable energy sources, including solar, that can provide solutions. So I think the challenge to policymakers and to the stakeholders in the energy sector is to find that mix to be able to provide the consumers, both big off-takers and small off-takers, the best price possible as they move forward towards you know, better lives and, and uh, healthier economies. Because we've got to find a way to live together in this energy hungry growing economy. It's going to happen. The emerging economies in, in this part of the world will, will certainly happen. Nagata, uh, although Japan still has a fairly small um, penetration of wind, it probably has the largest percentage of renewables of, of the countries represented here, perhaps apart from myself, that is. Um, but you, you also have a, a special issue in terms of transmission, in that it would, it's not just simply uh, balancing the overall power, but the fact that the, the wind power comes from one place, the load is in another. Yes. As you said, the transmission line program, a great problem, is a great issue for how to promote the wind power. And the, in the case of Japan, in, case, in the case of Japan, the northern part, northern island, is a very rich wind area. And the south, southern in a, a central area is a poor wind power resources. So how to transfer from the rich uh, wind area to uh, metropolitan area, it's a problem for the Japanese market. But uh, uh, it's, uh, it, in, in Japan, that there are nine franchised UTTs and uh, their systems are uh, separated almost. And there are some mutually connected transmission lines, but uh, they are not enough. And uh, so the Japanese government and uh, we are also th thinking that uh, not, it's not uh, in the long run it's, uh, there's a great problem. And uh, the more short run, how to absorb the fluctuation of uh, uh, fluctuation of wind power and uh, solar power in each area? How to absorb? And uh, uh, we are using uh, battery. Uh, NAS battery, natrium uh, sulfur battery type. But uh, uh, there are some uh, devices, for example, and a smart grid is one of the uh, ways how to absorb that one. And uh, we should learn the uh, preceding cases like uh, Denmark or Spain, because uh, Denmark would like to expand their wind power just not, not installing additional battery, but just promoting the electric vehicles using their batteries. It's automatically absorb the fluctuation of the uh, renewable energy, wind power. So uh, and in Sp Spain's case, they have uh, f uh, forecasting the tomorrow's climate and uh, how the wind power can supply. So uh, after that, uh, uh, in they, they expect the uh, wind power so they can manage and uh, prepare for the tomorrow supply. So it's another 
a way of the how to fluctuate and how to absorb and how to expand uh, renewable energy. So there are a lot of uh, technical methods and devices to how to absorb the fluctuation of renewable energy. So we should to learn about that. Okay, thank you very much. And, and thank you to the other panelists. Unfortunately, our time's come to an end. It seems to have gone past very quickly. Thank you very much.